second reading this morning comes to us from Luke's Gospel. It's been a while since we've heard from Luke. We've been mostly hearing from Mark in this uh, year, this liturgical year. Um, this is from the 24th chapter of Luke, the resurrection chapter, and comes later in the chapter starting at verse 36 and continuing through verse 48. Listen for God's word to you this morning. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet, while in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And see, I am sending you, at that, I'm sending you what my father promised. So stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. What did you have to eat on Easter? I mean... You know, besides the usual assortment of jelly beans, chocolate bunnies, and assorted candy treats, we stayed home and kept it simple with a, you know, slow-cooked pork tenderloin, potatoes, roasted asparagus. But Easter meals in years past have included a, a good bit of ham. Um, we did a brisket once, along with some macaroni and cheese, the token green vegetable, of course, and then followed by fresh strawberries and homemade shortcake, honest-to-goodness whipped cream that didn't come out of the can? Isn't that what par part of what makes a holiday special occasion, the food? Uh, usually it's a big meal served on the good china, maybe a bottle of wine, something special for dessert. On Thanksgiving, most folks, folks cook up a turkey. For Christmas, it might be roast beef. But it doesn't always have to be fancy. I can remember the first summer after my, my first summer of, of college. Uh, I lived and worked in the hills of eastern Kentucky doing stock theater at an amphitheater connected with the local state park. For the first six weeks, we were in rehearsal all day, every day. Uh, we, we'd get one show up and running, and then we'd turn right around and start working on the next until we had four musicals running in repertory. Our living quarters were not fancy. Uh, a roadside motel on the edge of town rented out for the summer season to lodge the company of players and musicians named, I kid you not, the Plantation Motel. I had to say it like that. Then suddenly it was the 4th of July and, you know, money was tight. We were staying at the motel. But I wanted a cookout. So I drove to the commercial center of town, the local Walmart, and bought myself a cheap charcoal grill, a lawn chair, a bag of charcoal, some ground beef, and all the fixins for grilled hamburgers. Ketchup, mustard, tomatoes, some buns. I'm telling you, it was worth every penny. Because even without the fireworks and all the rest, it tasted 
like the 4th of July. Looking at our reading from Luke this morning, it, peer, it appears as though such a meal is particularly appropriate for our celebration of Easter, because that is what the risen Jesus seems to enjoy doing the most with his friends and disciples. There's the account of the breakfast that John tells us about when Jesus cooked up fish on the beach over charcoal for the crew that had been out fishing all night. There's the story that takes place right before this one in Luke where Jesus walked along the Emmaus Road with a couple of his followers who couldn't even recognize him until they sat down together to eat. In fact, they're still talking about that encounter that Cleopas and his friend had had with Jesus on the road when all of a sudden he appears among them. Now, he doesn't say boo or whatever the first century Palestine equivalent is that ghosts are supposed to say. There is no rattling of doorknobs or shaking of window panes. I kind of wonder if they heard his arrival at all over the conversation about what had been happening. Cleopas, honestly, you didn't recognize him the whole time you were walking for hours? I'm telling you, Peter, when you think about it now, looking back, of course, I can see that it was him. It makes perfect sense. I could feel it. But at the time, I was all I was thinking about was getting as far from Jerusalem as my feet would take me. I mean, what did you think when you saw the tomb? Well, it sounded crazy. When Mary and the others kept going on about these men in white robes and his body gone missing and so I went to check it out for myself and I didn't see any angelic messengers. I didn't see anything at all really including his body. All that was left were the strips of cloth that they had wrapped him in. I didn't know what to think about it all. But you're sure it was him on the road. There's a part of me that likes to wonder just how long Jesus stood in that room. How long he waited for them to notice that he was there before he said anything. I can see them all gathered around some table, trying to puzzle it all out, trying to make sense of the stories they were hearing about their dead teacher who was somehow alive, and there he stands. But before anyone can say, he's standing right behind me, isn't he? He offers this simple salutation. Peace be with you. No wonder they were terrified. No wonder that even after he talked them down, explained that he wasn't a ghost, showed them his hands and feet, even in their joy at seeing him among them, no wonder they couldn't quite believe it. And we're still wondering. The former dean of Vanderbilt Divinity School, Sally McFaig, has suggested that the thing that makes human beings special, our most distinctive characteristic in a, a vast scope of creation in which we are unremarkable swimmers with an almost pathetic sense of smell and an even worse sense of direction, our most distinctive characteristic may be our capacity to wonder. For surely intelligence is not limited to human beings, nor is loyalty or perseverance. As McFaig puts it, many creatures know things, but the ability to step back, to reflect that we know, in other words, self-consciousness, that may well be our specialty. Unfortunately, we live in a world in which certainty carries a great deal of weight, and for good reason. Most of us wouldn't even consider stepping on board an airplane without the assurance that those flying it, those responsible for building and maintaining such a complex machine, were certain of what they were doing, certain that all that metal wouldn't simply fall out of the sky, which course, makes the recent spate of Boeing incidents so unsettling. Or who would buy a house built on someone's best guess about foundations and carpentry? And yet it is wonder that gives life its flavor. 
Maybe that's what Jesus was talking about when he said, you are the salt of the earth. Without wonder, without that flavor of life, days would pass and the color of bright green trees against a crisp New Mexico sky wouldn't mean a thing. The sweep of the setting sun casting the sandias pink would pass without notice. Without wondering, suffering becomes pointless. And love is reduced to a biological function or a chemical reaction. When Jesus suggested that only if we become like little children can we inherit the kingdom, I think he was talking about wonder. The kind that never stops asking questions, never stops trying to understand, even when the questions sound unanswerable and wear us out. Why is the sky blue? What happened to Grandma when she died? Where does God live? Did Adam and Eve have belly buttons? Sometimes the worst thing that can happen to a person of faith is to become infected by the language of religious certainty. Because certainty almost always kills our capacity for wonder. And in the process, robs us of one of the most precious gifts that God can give us. In that room with Jesus, the disciples are filled with joy, and disbelief and wonder. Truly, that sounds like a wholly appropriate reaction to the mystery of resurrection during the season of Easter. If we don't stand slightly slack-jawed at the presence of our crucified Lord raised from the dead and asking for a, a bite to eat, something has gone terribly wrong. To wonder is to acknowledge that we haven't got it all figured out, that we're not even close. To wonder is to be open to what God may yet show us. Isn't that ultimately what happens in that room? This is what I was trying to tell you all along, Jesus explains. And just like he did with Cleopas and his friend, he begins to talk to them about what is in the scripture. Now, I know that a lot of you don't read the Bible all that often. No, don't say anything. I know. Some of you do. That's great. But my guess is that more of you don't. And it's, it isn't because you think the Bible is unimportant or unnecessary. Chances are that it scares you. Scares the heck out of you. Not just because of some of the more unsettling parts of the Old Testament, but more the scope of it all. What does it all mean anyway? Should you read it cover to cover or skip around? Maybe you think you don't know enough for any of it to make sense. But what we discover this morning is that you don't need a PhD in ancient languages to read the Bible or even the first clue about where to find any particular book. All you need is a group of friends, the present peace of Jesus among you, and a sense of wonder at the remarkable promise of forgiveness and new life to be found if you will approach the words you find there with your eyes and your mind wide open to the living word of life. These are the places where the risen Christ continues to make himself known where friends gather in joy and disbelief and wonder, at the table where we break bread together and eat, in the scriptures where our minds are opened to the radical promises God has made in Jesus. It's a simple recipe, really, for the food of eternal life. And when we put it all together, wouldn't you know it, it just tastes like Easter. It tastes like resurrection. Hallelujah. Amen.
Would you stand as together we say what we believe using the words of affirmation from Romans 8, published, printed in your worship order. We believe there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to God's purpose. We are convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus our Lord. Amen.